Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Spectral Data 101, How to Communicate Colored Data. Presenting today is Ed Hattenberger, a senior color scientist at X-Ray Pantone. I'm Robert Grotanz, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Just a few things to go over before we get started. Due to the number of people that are attending today's webinar, we will keep everyone muted. If you have any questions, please use the questions function on the GoToWebinar panel. We will have time to answer a few questions at the end. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and you will receive a link so that you can review the webinar at your convenience. So with that, I will turn it over to Ed to get things started. Oh, thanks, Robert. Uh, welcome to uh, our little webinar today. Uh, again, the title is Spectral Data 101, How to Communicate Color Data. And I'm Ed Hattenberger, Senior Color Scientist. I just wanted to let everybody know, uh, for obvious reasons, I am working from home. So if it sounds like a zoo in here, we do have a dog, a couple hamsters, and a snake and some fish. So it is a zoo. So hopefully there won't be any interruptions. So in today's presentation, <clears throat> we're going to cover two topics. One is identifying color. I want to walk through the limitations of specifying D lab labs. And two is capturing color. I want to explain the differences between color measurement instruments and when to use them when you need to capture color information. So why working with spectral data is important. C lab metamerism and spectral reflectance. The way we see colors has been mathematically mapped out so that we can describe all visible colors in the form of numbers. Like longitude, latitude, and altitude can describe a location on the planet. Three values in C-Lab can tell us what color we are looking at and how light or dark it is and how vibrant a color is. So the L-star axis on the figure on the left describes how light or dark a color is. A-star, this axis right here, I'm, I'm highlighting with my mouse, so hopefully you can see that describes the redness and greenness of a color, while V star describes the yellowness and blue. So in the image of above, the green dot represents a color in C-Lab space, and the sphere around the dot is a color tolerance metric called delta E. So when I, when I, how I like to think about this is I always tell people like, oh, picture you're in the middle, you're floating in the middle of a hamster ball. And if you look down, Colors are, as you look down in color space, colors are getting darker. You look up, they're getting lighter. And depending on your orientation, either you're looking left or right, maybe they're looking yellow or greener, and yellow or bluer. But the edge of that hamster ball is what you find acceptable as far as a color difference. In other words, I'm, I'm the, I, you're floating in the center, you're the color that's targeted. The edge of the ball to the left is maybe how green a color I would accept. It's gonna get the color, as you move left, the color's getting a little bit greener and how far the edge of that sphere is how far I would accept, like that's as green as a color can get before I say it's not acceptable anymore. So look at the image on the right, it kind of illustrates up and down is your L star, colors are getting darker to lighter. <clears throat> Again, A star is red to blue, or sorry, red to green, and B star is you get yellower and bluer. So I want to take you through an example of metamerism. And we sell a product, Pantone sells a product called the D15 lighting indicator. And I've, I have the yellow, green, blue, and red squares to show you the orientation of a color in C-Lab space. So we're looking top down. We're looking from the top of this axis down to the color plane, A, B, A star, B star. So, in this, in this illustration, we're saying the top color is the standard, which is in the middle in the middle here, it's surrounded by a black line. The bottom is a match to the standard, and it's by green line in this blue sphere. Think of that as, well, it's not a sphere, it's an ovoid, but think of that as like your hamster ball. That's, it's only two dimensional right now, but think of that as like, a, like an egg shape uh, tolerance in C-Lab space. So when we view this lighting sticker indicator under D50 illumination in the light booth, 
we get a delta E, a calculated delta E, which is a color difference of 0 0.9. And 0 0.9, usually we say roughly a 1.0 is just noticeable, just noticeable difference. So you can just barely see difference. And if you look at the, the example on the left here, you can kind of see a little bit of a difference in color, but you'd say, yeah, no, they're pretty close, they match. So if you're in a light booth and then you switch the luminant to fluorescent, let's say F11, the delta E jumps to 8.4, and as you can see in the example on the left, the standard has moved. And then this is the black, the moment the black line has moved. The match to that standard has shifted red. So it's definitely out of tolerance. So in the previous slide, you can see everything's within that delta E sphere. This sphere represents a delta E of two. I should say ovoid represents a delta E of two. And now you can see, again, this ovoid represents a delta E of two. And we're here way out of tolerance. So what happened? So before I get into what happened, I wanna talk about what is spectral reflectance as an introduction. So the color of an object is directly related to the wavelengths of light reflected and absorbed. So spectral data is a more accurate, accurate method to describe and communicate color. So if you look at the plot on the right here, I've colored these spectral curves based on what their actual color is. So in this case, this blue line is actually blue. The gray is actually a spectral reflectance of a gray color. And as you can see, the blue is actually reflecting more blue light. If you look at the um, the rainbow in the background, you can see, oh, and my peak is in the blue, and so I'm going to reflect blue. But as I move towards the yellow, the greens, the yellows, and the reds, I'm going to absorb those lights, so I'm not going to reflect it back to the eye or the measurement device. Same for the gray line. Think of a gray. Gray is really just reflecting all wavelengths fairly equally, so it looks more neutral. And again, we have the orange line, which is absorbing the short wavelength lights down in the violet and the purple and some of the green. And then as you move into the longer wavelength lights, it's reflecting those, therefore it looks orange. <clears throat> so it's gonna get a little technical here and I'll try to do uh, my best to explain it. So what's going on? Why does this happen? So if we look at the graph on the left here, we're looking at the relative power distributions of two light sources. One is noon daylight D50, and the other is store, which is F11. So D50, as you can see, this top bluish line, it's very, it's, it's relatively spectrally flat when you compare it to F11, which is very spiky. As you can see, there's a spike here in the violet region, there's a spike in the green region, and there's a spike in the, uh, the red region. So what's going on there is is the light bulb has phosphors and fluor phosphors in there, and when they're excited with electricity, they eliminate light at very specific wavelengths, and it's not not as smooth as, as say like something like daylight. So as we shift the graph on the left over to the, the spectral distribution on the right, actually let me go back. Sorry, threw me a little bit. Let me talk about the graph on the right. So the top curve of remember the D50 lighting indicator that we showed previously the top is this green line here and this is a spectral measurement of that curve I actually took in uh, one of our devices and I measured it and I plotted it so the bottom which was the match under D50 is this reddish line down here so when you have two pieces or <laughs> when you have two spectral reflectances that look like spaghetti thrown on a plot you know you have a recipe for uh, metamerism because you see a lot of these crossover points where the spectral curves are crossing over. Okay, let's, let's shift the graph over. So I wanna make note of these two peaks in fluorescent and F11. And if you look at where light is getting reflected and absorbed, and think back to that graph I just talked about <clears throat> where blue is reflecting blue light and orange is reflecting orange light. So if you look at, this is the greenish portion of the spectrum. And if you look at this, the major peak in F11, you can see that this, the green curve is higher here. So it's saying you need to reflect more green light. And you look at this, the, the bottom of the D50 indicator, which is red, and it's saying don't reflect as much green light. So, and there's a massive peak of energy here. So it's going to, it's going to the top of the curve is going to shift green, or it's gonna reflect more green light in the, in the bottom curve which is the red curve is gonna reflect less green light. And the same over here, because this explains why one turned wet, red, and one turned green. So if you look at this peak over here, which is the second largest peak of the spectral curve, of the spectral uh, emission, 
you can see that the red curve is reflecting more red light and this green curve, which is the top of the D15 lighting indicator, is, is told not to reflect as much red light. So that's why the bottom of the D15 indicator shifts red and the top stays green. So hopefully, hopefully that made sense. Uh, so now we're going to talk about how to collect spectral data or how to collect color data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about color emitter versus a spectrophotometer, but I'm mostly going to focus on spectrophotometers. So a color emitter, if you look at this plot on the right here, there, there is a light source. And we're in a, I, I don't explain uh, the different geometries right now, but we'll just take this as uh, a 45-0 representation right now. And I'll explain more about that later. So if you look at this diagram, the light source is on a 45-degree angle, and it's emitting light and the sample here is at the bottom. So we're getting full light onto the sample and we have a receiver, which is our detector. It's detecting the light that's reflected off the sample. We have an optics here, an optical path, which has some other stuff that we really don't need to cover right now. And then think of it as there's three filters. So there's a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. There's only three filters, which think of it like C-Lab. There's only three numbers that can rep represent a C-Lab number, right? L star, A star, and B star. So at a very high level, think of it's capturing that information. So because you're only using three filters, you really can't determine how a color will look under different light sources, which means you can't detect metamerism. So a color emitter is not good for, for detecting metamerism, and it would not detect our example here. To, to this device, the colors would look the same. And again, I have this little plot on the lower left here, which basically shows we have an X-ray color emitter called an I1 Pro. And it is very good for, for measuring, for calibrating your displays. So that's one, one, uh, one of our products that, that we use for calibration of displays. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to how spectrophotometer measures. So, the, the general optical path is the same. So we have a light source at 45 degrees. We have our sample at the bottom. The light shines down, and then we come up through the optical path, and we have a receiver. But again, if you look at the number of filters, instead of having, let's say, three filters, we have, could be 30 filters, 31 filters. It depends on the device. But the point is we're capturing information in much smaller color range. So when you look at that spectral plot, think of like you're breaking up of the rainbow into much smaller slices instead of just red, green, and blue. You're you're slicing up a rainbow in very very fine slices, and you're collecting a number at each of those slices. So then you can report back the spectral reflectance. So that's why spectrophotometers can determine how a color will look under different light sources, and it can detect metamerism. So and now we'll get into the different types of spectrophotometers, which is like instrument geometries. First, we're going to talk about single angle spectrophotometers, which we define as 045 or 450. And the reason we call them 450 is because, for example, in this case on the diagram on the right, the light source is at 45 degrees and the re receiver is at zero degrees, assuming that the, uh, the plane is at uh, zero degrees. So the light sh shown is presented to the sample at 45 and then the, the receiver detects it at zero degrees. So it illuminates the sample with direct light, and they're designed to exclude gloss from the measurement. And they're, they're generally referred to as specular excluded, although that's more for sphere geometries, but we can refer to them as, as seeing things spectrally excluded. And this closely replicates how the human eye sees color. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, think about when you read a book. You naturally, uh, let's say you're in a room and you're reading a book. When you, when you hold the book to your eyes, you generally tilt the book so that you get the best, so that you don't get the light. You know how when you hold a book at a certain angle to, a, to the light source, you can see the light source reflecting off the black text, so the text kind of looks whitish? Well, you naturally try to avoid that because it's hard to distinguish the text, assuming the text is glossy and then the paper is not, and not as glossy. So you're orientating the book so that you get the best contrast, and which is really a spectral, specular occluded, excluded, uh, viewing condition 
when you, when you do that. So here we have some single single angle spectrophotometers, and I want to go over the use cases. So single angle spectrophotometers are good for comparing samples of common texture where gloss is not a factor. So a printed material or paints. So I recommend not using them for mirror or near mirrored surfaces, rough textured woven or deeply patterned surfaces. Think of carpets and samples that are colored with metallic, pearlescent, or special effects pigments, which is automotive paints. So our device at the top here is our i1 Pro 3, which we just released. These are very good for printer profiling. You can also use them for display, display profiling because they can measure uh, transmittance of a color. So they'll actually, you don't need to, they can turn the light, there's a light source in there for anyone to measure a printed sample, but we can turn the lights off, light source off when we measure, want to measure like a display. So they're good for backlit signage. And a plus here is the i1 Pro 3 Plus is good for textiles. And the i1 Pro 3 Plus has a bigger aperture. So if you look back, for example, to this slide right here, this hole where the light passes through is bigger on an i1 Pro 3 as compared to an i1 Pro 2. So you, if your textile, and what that does is that kind of averages out the sample. So you know how there's textiles, there's a little, the weave and the weft, there's little, there could be dark spots in the, where the light's not reflected uh, as at different angles. So the i1 Pro 3 has a bigger aperture to kind of average that noise out and capture a more accurate color representation or the spectral data for that color. The example below is an exact, and this is really targeted for the packaging industry. And one of the main reasons is the exact can be net, net profiled for traceability. And in short, net profiler is a way to, uh, basically it's a package that you can get for the exact and you can measure, uh, it's about eight colors. And basically it runs the exact through a bunch of tests and then it sends that information back to X-Rite and it can tell you whether your exact is functioning within specification or not. And that's really important, especially for the, the packaging industry, because you have to remember that a lot of these devices are used, let's say, in an ink room or next to press. There's different people using them. It could get dropped very easily and things could get out of whack. So net profiler is a way to make sure like, hey, my instrument's functioning properly because you don't want to obviously measure color and think it's right where it's really wrong because that can, that can cause problems. I wanted to call out I wanted to call out a non-contact single angle spectrophotometer that we have called MetaView. And although we typically say you can't measure textiles in carpets for our traditional 450 devices, the MetaView can be used for carpet vinyl or fabric because it has technology to select specific areas for color measurement. So it has an adjustable aperture size from two to 12 millimeters. If you look at the example on the right here, you can see the circle. So you can make the circle larger or smaller depending on what color you would like to measure. And it has a live preview of the measurement you're taking. And it will detect like the, the main colors. It'll pick out the number of colors or you know, up to three. There may be settings for more, but you can, you can basically say like, oh, I'll measure this, this circle. I found a red color, I found a brown color, maybe maybe another brown color here, this light brown, this dark brown, and this red color. So it's a way to accurately say like, oh, I wanna measure this color. And a lot of times with, the, with say one of our other devices, trying to find that specific color, if the color patch is really small, you're not gonna be able to put the aperture over it. You may get a mixture of, let's say, this lighter brown or this darker brown. So it's it's really a nice way to to, measure color with a much smaller area. So moving on to a different type of technology, which is the sphere spectrophotometer. So a sphere spectrophotometer illuminates with diffused light. It does capture gloss information. So spin measurements measure color, not appearance, and spec measurements include the surface appearance in the measurement. So I'll go over this a little bit more in detail. If we look at the example, the diagram on the right. Spin mode, which is measuring the pure color, which excludes the effect of gloss in the evaluation. So in this case, you have a light source here on the left, and you have a sphere, which is coated with a very, very white, diffuse material. 
So you're not directly illuminating the sample. You're basically shining light within the sphere. There's a port, which is which the sample is underneath, and the light reflects all that sample. And all this light inside here mixes around, and it goes out to the receiver, and it measures the color. So it includes the gloss information. So if, now if we're measuring in spec mode, I'm sorry, spin excludes the effect of gloss. Now if we measure in spec mode, we're measuring the appearance of the color. So we include the evaluation of gloss in the, in the measurement. So in this case, there's a specular exclusion port that's eight degrees off of normal from the surface, which is opposite the receiver. So basically, all that light comes in at, at the specular angle is lost to the sphere, and we only capture the light that, um, that is not it doesn't include the specular information. So that's why we call it specular excluded. So sphere spectrophotometers are good for mirror and mirror-like surfaces. Think aluminum cans or metallic inks. Uh, most uh, affect all of your aluminum cans that you drink out of, the water, the beer, the Pepsi, Coke. They're all measured with a sphere device because the light is captured if you think about back to a 45 zero case, if you shine an angle of light at 45 degrees, most of the light will go off in 45 degrees and it won't get to collected by the sensor. So it's good for highly textured surfaces, textiles, carpets, and plastics. Again, because it can average all the noise out of the measurement, because there may be dark spots, dark areas where the where the where the um, Let's say for, if you're measuring a carpet, you can think about how noisy a carpet looks. It's kind of averaging that noise out. And it's good for samples that have different gloss levels. Again, don't use them for, think of color uh, colors with metallic fluorescent or special effects pigments, which is automotive paints. So on the right here, we have two. Uh, I'm an example of our CEI 7000 series, which is a benchtop sphere-based spectrophotometer. These are very high, highly accurate. And what these also have is a trans transmission mode. So you can measure things like orange juice. You can put a sample, if you see uh, on the right here, I'm highlighting with my mouse, it's kind of hard to see, but there's an open area in the device. You can put, we have a sample holder where you can put, you can measure, let's say you want to measure the color of glass or something, uh, or a sample that you can see through a piece of plastic. You can measure that because it, it can measure transmittance. So the light goes through the sample and it's collected by the uh, the sphere in the device and it returns spectral reflectance, specular included and specular excluded. So again, this, this one has an onboard camera, which is nice to position the sample and it connects to a PC. So you have to, you just can't run this on its own. It connects to uh, a PC such as uh, uh, Color IQC is one of our software products that can uh, talk to this device. We also have a CI60 series, which is a handheld. These are, again, high accuracy. The advantage is they're portable. They have an on-screen display, a color display, and you can store the samples on the device. So if you're doing some, they, they can also connect to a PC, but you can also store the samples on the device if, you're, if, you're, if it's not easy to work with, a, you know, have a computer or a laptop right next door to where you're working. So this is the, one of the final devices we have, which is a multi-angle spectrophotometer. So these are, think of these as kind of like a 45-0 device, except they can measure at more, more angles. So they illuminate the sample with direct light at a single angle, and they measure at multiple angles. So again, it kind of simulates as if the sample is being moved back and forth, like tilting a sample to see a change at various angles. So you've done that with paints. Depending on the flake or the mica that's in the pearlescent that's in the paint, you can kind of rotate the rotate the paint or look, think about looking at the surface of a car. You can see like the different angles. Sometimes the paint appears very dark. Sometimes the paint appears very light. And this kind of captures that information. So these are very, these multi-angle spectrophotometers you should use for car paints with metallic or pearlescent particles, cosmetics, and colors that travel as the sample is rotated. So you think if you were to paint a flat surface with a, a metallic paint or car paint, you can see that as you as you rotate that sample to and from your eye, it could change lightness and darkness and color. And they're they're not good. Again, 
these these device small tangle devices are not good for mirror or near mirrored surfaces or rough textured woven or deeply patterned surfaces such as carpets. So the two devices we have are the MAT6 and the MAT12. They both look the they're both in the same the same body but one has six angles the T6 and one has 12 angles. So the in general again we can we don't have time to get into the details, but a T6 you would use for materials that shift in lightness. So think about, you know, when you're rotating that sample, a paint sample, you can see like, oh, or think about it when you look at a car, the curves and the surface of the car, sometimes the paint looks really dark, sometimes it looks a lot lighter. The T6 will capture that information. The, the T12 is more geared for materials that shift in lightness and chroma. So think about those, those crazy paints, um, one example is that crazy. You always see it in the green and purple. Every once in a while, you'll see a car or a sample on the internet that has, a, you know, depending on how you look at it, it could look purple or it could look green. That will capture that info and, and be able to capture that information and be able to use it for uh, for quality control. Our device at the bottom is the MA5 QC. This is the the, the top the top device T6 slash T12. It really has to be held with two hands. It's very, it's very big because it measures a bigger area. The MA5 QC is lightweight. Um, there isn't a camera like in the T6 or the T12, and it's, it's smaller, so you can use it with a single hand, which is nice. So that's it for today. Um, thanks for joining us. Here's uh, some information if you need to contact us here at x -Rite. And... Again, thanks for joining in. So I can entertain some questions now if anybody has any. Yeah. So yeah. So if you haven't submitted a question yet, feel free to do so. I see we have a few questions coming in already. I don't know if you can see these, Ed, and you see any that you want to answer. Feel free to start going through some. Yeah. Sure. Uh, here's a question. Are there standard illuminate lamps which have the same spectral power distribution as the standard, i.e. without the mercury emission bands, but also not by a combination of narrow LEDs? Uh, I don't believe so. I mean, so typically when you think of lighting, the light, I mean, incandescent light, which is your old school light bulb with the filament, they all have, that has a very specific spectral power distribution. distribution. We there's illuminance there's uh, illuminance for different par, uh, like different fluorescent lights. There could there's several of them. There's like F1, F2, all the way to F11. So it really depends on how your the light source you should use really depends on where you think your product's going to be used. So if you're like your primary product use is outdoors, you would probably want to test under D50. That being said, the advantage of using like if you're doing QC for for a color. I would say you really want to test under three illuminants for metamerism. So there's a way to calculate a, a metameric index, and that's in our software. So typically, in general, people use like D50, uh, F11, and let's say incandescent light for detecting metamerism because those three light sources kind of cover the different unique areas of the visible spectrum. And it's the most you'll see the most drastic change in the tamarism. So if you have two spectral curves that match, like if those two spectral curves in that plot were laid directly on top of each other, the tamarism would be zero, and everything would match under all, all all light sources. So I hope that I hope that answers your question. I, I'm I'm not exactly sure. Um, I, I don't know if I can provide any more information any more information on that question. Um, yeah, Robert, someone asked if you'll provide a link to the recorded session, and I yeah. believe you will. Yeah, um, yeah, we, we will send a link to this recording 24 hours after it's okay. taken place. Let's take a couple more questions. I, I see okay. a lot coming in. Um, you don't have to go in order. I don't know if there's any in particular that I think speak to you. Sure. Yeah, can I use my X-ray spectrophotometer for optical density measurements? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> we are we have the ability to calculate optical density. It could be any density. I mean, you think about in the printing industry, there's different status densities. So 
optical density is, is basically a one version of that. So if you have the spectrum information, you can calculate optical density. Is that with all instruments, or is that a specific instrument you would recommend? No, it depends on your it depends on your uh, application. So a lot of these are very application specific. So if it yes, you can calculate it from spectral data, but you may have to make sure you're using the right device for the right application. So here's a question: What are the challenges for measuring cosmetic colors, and which of the spectrophotometers is best suited to measuring cosmetic colors? This is a bit tricky because Cosmetic colors can be, um, they put different particles in there, right, for lack of a better term. So there could be like little flakes in there that give it kind of a little bit of a little bit of a sheen. So in some cases, a sphere might be the right instrument. In other cases, um, uh, a, a multi-angle could be, could be the way to look at it, or even a meta view, because a meta view, you can pick specific areas um, and get in kind of an average average spectral response for whatever you're for your measuring. And I also like to point out that with cosmetic colors, application is very important too because I know um, we have a cosmetics lab, and when I when I talk to one of my colleagues there, she always says like application is important because if you if you're trying to measure something, you have to be careful because if you're putting something on a piece of flat piece of paper, let's say you're you're doing a lipstick drawdown, well. The way it measures there might not be the same it measures on lips because skin is translucent. So really, it depends on the specific case that you're trying to measure. And, and, and if you have more information, I would, I would call x right and we could, we could have a solution architect come help you with uh, very specific applications like cosmetic because it can be a little bit tricky. Let's uh, take more one questions? more question. Okay. And that goes for anyone, actually. Um, there's a lot of questions in here asking very specifically about their applications. If yeah. you give us a call, um, our solution architects are definitely willing and able to help figure out how to measure color depending on your workflow. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Robert. So I can take this last one. Can you talk about the causes of metamorphism? How do you use the spectra data? to problem solve. Well, the, the cause of metamorphism is matching a color using C-Lab values. That's the primary reason. You could say like, okay, I have a color that I want to match and you you have a, you bring in a standard, uh, say it's a red color. You bring in the standard and you say, okay, match this for me. If somebody, there's, and the way, the way to do it is you could either use software to do it or you could use, let's say, your eye. So if you said somebody match this plastic by eye with um, in another type of plastic or match it on a piece of paper or let's say a printer, come up with a way to like print out a bunch of red colors and pick the one that you think is a visual match under let's say D50. So if you go through that process and you find a match, the issue is is that you think about what goes into making a plastic. There's there's pigments that go into making a plastic. So there's so and those pigments are definitely not the same as what you're going to find on a printed sheet of paper, right? The printing inks have a different spectral, the base inks, right? If you have a different spectral reflectance than the base pigments that go into a plastic. So you can create this match, this visual match to say, oh, this looks good. But then if you switch the light source, to say like F11 in our example here, or even tungsten, which is the old school light bulb, the color can shift because you made a match using your eyes, which are, think about three numbers, right? We talked about the color imagery. It can't detect metamorphism, L star, A star, and B star. So if you, now if you were to do a spectral match, you'd get a much closer match. If you were to say, okay, okay, well, I'm gonna measure my plastic sample and I'm gonna measure, and I'm gonna create a spectral match. This would be very difficult to do in print, in, on print, unless you have special software or you write your own. Then you could say like, oh, okay, I'm gonna use that spectral data to create a match on a print. And in that case, you're going to get a, bet, a much better match. So I think that's the last question we have time yep. for. Um, I just want to thank yeah. everybody attending. Sorry about the audio issue there. Um, I think the Internet's overloaded because everybody's on the Internet working from home <laughs> in the whole country. So thanks for yeah, uh, we, being patient with we me. Did, there's a lot of questions we didn't get to. I'll I'll do my best to send those over to our support team as well. Um, 
one link that I actually did not provide Ed to include on his last slide here. We also have a YouTube channel. I believe it's slash YouTube slash x ray for the number four color. We have a video out there that we just created called What is a Spectrophotometer? It's basically a five minute version of what Ed just talked about. So if you'd like something to share with your team, um, I can send that out as an email to everyone as well. It's kind of a nice little animated video that kind of goes through this quickly. So again, yeah, so I got the audio. Um, I'll edit this and I'll have the recording sent out within 24 hours as well. So again, everyone, thanks for your time. Stay healthy and stay safe.